Good morning. Would you like a biggie? Oh, you're not going to stand still for it. Come on. There we go. It's really cold this morning. So this morning's outsiders will be inside in front of the fire. I'm just getting set up for it now. It got down to two degrees last night and now it's about four degrees. So off to the outsiders. 24th of July 2016. Time now for Outsiders. I'm Barry Cassidy and you're not. Thank you, Barry. Time now indeed for Outsiders. Joining me today from Sydney, uh, Trish Ja, Policy Analyst at the Centre for Independent Studies. Hi, Sydney. Hi, Trish. Hello. Uh, we have in the studio as well Dr. Zare Gazarian from the School of Social Scientists, Scientists at Monash University and author of Politics for Dummies. I'm sure I massacred your last name. I'm very sorry about that. No, perfect, Sammy. Well done. All right, thank you. And Nick Pike, editor of The Monthly. Good morning. All right, hello to you all. Well, let's begin with the world's most enthralling spectator sport as it continues ramping up. Of course, I'm talking about the US presidential elections in which timing is everything. The Democratic candidate Hillary Clinton has waited till the end of the GOP convention to announce her running mate. We will offer a very different vision for our country. One that is about building bridges, not walls. <coughs> embracing the diversity that makes our country great, <laughs> lifting each other up, standing together. And that's why I am so thrilled to announce that my running mate is a man who doesn't just share those values, he lives them. I have to say that Senator Tim Kaine is everything Donald Trump and Mike Pence are not. Trish, what can we say about Tim Kaine? Will he help Hillary Clinton? I think he will. And I know that a lot of people, sort of, you know, the Bernie bros and left wing supporters are thinking, this is a big mistake. You know, this Trump is coasting off like an outsider appeal and Hillary has just doubled down on her insider <coughs> nature by picking a guy like <coughs> Tim Kaine. But I think that this is a very obviously strategically pitched at winning over those centrist voters and those um, never Trump Republicans, people who look at Trump and just say, I cannot do this. And then see Tim Kaine, someone who's, you know, socially conservative in his morals, if not necessarily always in his po policy, uh, someone from a southern state, you know, a Democrat from Virginia someone respectable and mainstream even if they're not you know too crash hot in hillary someone who can make voting hillary kate like clinton and kane sort of worthwhile zara i mean senator kane is from virginia in virginia is where the nra is headquartered the national rifle association against which he's won some pretty notable achievements including background checks and things like that um wouldn't the, is this hillary signaling the next big battle in american politics it could be, Sammy, and I think the interesting thing about this choice is that Hillary is taking on someone who's never lost an election, so that's something very good about him, so hopefully she hopes right. that, that that charm will keep on going. But the interesting thing about Tim Kaine is that he is, he is, in some ways, a bit of an ordinary citizen in his background. Um, uh, uh, his father, I think, was a, 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 a welder, he, he owned a small metal workshop, in Kansas. So he's very much coming from to government and politics as a small business person, as an average person, rather than um, this person that's been part of the democratic machine. And I think that's the angle that they will go on. And that will, to some extent, tempt those Democrats who may be erring on supporting Trump. So this is, this is a, a very solid move. Nick, there's this aspect of this whole thing, which Trish just mentioned as well, which is the Bernie bros, the, the Bernie Sanders supporters, as they're notoriously called. And um, they had largely been hoping for, I think, it seems like, an Elizabeth Warren pick, because she's very anti-Big Bank. Um, Tim Kaine is very openly pro-Big Bank, anti-deregulation. Um, how is this <coughs> Hillary appeasing with Wall Street? 
Yeah, I, I'm not sure if it's about appeasing Wall Street so much as deciding not to make a, a, make a big deal out of having a new kind of political ticket. As in, if she'd chosen another woman, inevitably there would have been a narrative about, look, we have a woman and a, and a, a woman for president and vice presidential candidates. I think she decided that she would try and swing her ticket back towards the centre. So Tim Kaine's an extremely kind of respectable pick in that respect. He was a, he was a successful governor. He was a successful senator. Uh, he was the mayor in Richmond, Virginia as well. As, as Zara said, he's he's never lost. He seems to be a very sort of safe bet, I think. I think what was interesting about the uh, the speech that Clinton gave also was afterwards the sharp distinction she drew between her ticket being one of positivity and light and optimism, which was so clearly uh, pitched against the previous day's speech by Trump, which was... Yeah, which has been dubbed the, the nightmare in America speech. Well, positive light and optimism might be, you know, being torpedoed from the side by the WikiLeaks thing. Trish, the, the WikiLeaks has released all these raft of documents showing that um, the DNC collaborated with the press against Bernie Sanders. Will this, will the, will the Democratic Party now bleed those Bernie bros? I think it's possible that they might, but to that point, to that same extent, I think there is like a very large contingent of dedicated Bernie bros who are desperate, desperate not to see a Trump presidency because they know exactly what that would mean for the country. So it might mean that they abstain, might mean that they go to vote for Jill Stein and the Green Party, might mean that they some of them might even vote for the Libertarian candidate. Um, so it's possible that they, they might not have those kind of that campaign... They might not be able to rely on those votes, but I think overall, I guess there was that idea that you know that was rigged in favour of Hillary, and this certainly won't do anything to kind of assuage those fears. But in, in in terms of the actual content of the leaks, from my perspective, I'm not entirely convinced it's such a big deal. Um, Zara, you, we, the GOP convention is over. Donald Trump is now officially the candidate. There were no last minute changes. Mitt Romney didn't parachute down from the ceiling as many <laughs> analysts were predicting and some seem to be hoping even. What's, is, is, it's done. Donald Trump is now the, the you know, the leading candidate. He is, he is, and what a remarkable, what a remarkable ride he's had um, from basically seen to be a bit of a novelty and a bit of a joke earlier in the year. He's now <coughs> the, the candidate. And part of the appeal has to be not only his, his charismatic approach to politics, but certainly what he's saying is clearly resonating with some sections of the American community. And whether we as uh, observers in Australia agree, disagree with his views, I, I think it's undeniable that he has this magnetism that is generating all this support, all this buzz. Now, of course, we'll, no we'll know exactly how much support and buzz he gets in November. But up until that point, he he's dominated American politics for the year. Right, and there, I mean, there was no subtlety to the domination during the during the GOP convention. At least, there those pictures coming out, very large Trump kind of advertising right there. Um, Nick, wait, wait, what does this say about the state of American politics right now? Because we had during the convention the Melania, Melania Trump um, plagiarism accusation. We had Ted Cruz come out and just refuse to endorse him. He's Teflon Trump. Nothing seems to hurt this guy. Yeah, I think I think. There's something fundamental that underlies everything that Trump says, which is he he appeals to a great amount of fear that, that exists in American society. And, and we could tell from his speech that he was really exploiting that to the max. He, he has a, a kind of neo-protectionist message. He has one about, he, he talks about, he has a sense of, there's a sense of isolationism in his foreign policy utterings. Uh, it's It's all about... America's borders. So I think people want to hear that there's a strong man who will protect America. The fact that there is no policy underlying any of his statements and that it's racist and xenophobic, these these sorts of things are secondary to some people, I think, to his fundamental message. Sorry, but we have this thing. I don't know if anyone remembers, there was, um, and now I'm blanking on his name because I just have decided to think of him, but one of the candidates during the 2008 election, I believe, and he was doing well in the election, he was run up, and he gave like a, a scream on stage, if anyone remembers. Howard Dean. Howard Dean, that's right. Howard yeah. Dean did a scream on stage, and, the, and just this one tiny clip of him making a strange sound sank his entire <laughs> campaign. 
And now Trump can do anything and nothing seems to affect him. How have we gotten the point in US politics where he's immune to criticism and mockery? Well, it's interesting, Sammy, because up until this point, voters have not really thought of him as a potential president. They've seen him as a potential candidate for, for the Republican Party. But now that we get into the business end of the election cycle, the question will be how many people will actually think that this is the man that can lead them for the next four years, potentially eight years. And I think that's where his lack of policy content, his lack of policy substance may start to hurt him. Up until this point, he's been coasting on popularity, his star power, and he's just been saying things, basically, just plucking them from the ear. Um, great sound clips, great sound bites. But the question, and presumably this is what the Hillary camp will be trying to exploit, the question is, is this man ready for government? Trish, there was a story in the New York Times which didn't get the traction that many are now kind of noticing and realizing it should have maybe gotten, which is uh, rumors coming out from other people vetted um, or approached by the Trump camp to be VP candidates and how uh, they were being offered that, look, Trump sees himself more as a chairman of the board, not a CEO or a COO, and whoever's the VP will basically be actually the president in terms of practicality. Uh, <coughs> do you think Mike Pence is the man then, perhaps, if you know, there is a pre President Trump to actually be, you know, de facto President Pence? Well, I think it's interesting in the way that Pence pitched himself at the Republican National Con Convention is that when he was talking about how he was like, committed Christian and married to his wife of, you know, his high school sweetheart, his wife, 30 years and all this sort of stuff. He was almost pitching himself as the anti-Trump, like a real conservative alternative to this flamboyant, faux conservative Trump. So in that sense, that was quite interesting. So in the sense that he seems to be that kind of attempt to bring more respectability, a bit more stability, a bit more of the Republican insiderness to the ticket, I think it's possible that that kind of would align quite well with what you've just said about the VP being effectively the president. In terms of what that means for the entire system, though, if, if the presidential candidate of one of the two major parties who stands a decent chance of winning is kind of behind closed doors saying, oh, you know, it's not really for me. I'm guessing that, like, you know, you, you will really be the, the main guy. You will be the guy in charge. Just thinking, how have we gotten to this point? I still, I still remain to be convinced that he, that he actually joined the presidential race to become president. It seems sometimes that you still it, think it's an advertising campaign. Sometimes for Trump I think hotels. he's still advertising his brand, and he just accidentally got to this point, and everyone's yes. yeah. I've heard that same thing actually from like sort of Republican insiders as well. So the world's greatest improv game is <laughs> unfolding. And before we're very eyes, <coughs> moving on now um, to Munich or the Munich gunman police have said has no connection with ISIS, but rather an obsession with white supremacist Anders Bering Breivik, who bombed and shot 77 people in Norway. On the Breivik case, there are certain connections. For a start, it's the date. And secondly, it's also the age of the victims. And thirdly, it is the overarching theme Zare, how reasonable were the initial assumptions by people that this was ISIS related? I think whenever there's a report of violence now, there's this automatic assumption that it's somehow terrorist related or ISIS related. And initial reports that I was hearing and, and watching with people, this, this inevitable sense that oh, it's clearly an ISIS inspired attack. Um, and of course, we now know that it wasn't, it clearly wasn't, and this person was um, suffering from, reportedly suffering from mental health issues as well. So um, it's interesting how, just as an observer, how these sorts of things take a life of their own. And um, it was only after some time that we got a clearer picture um, that this, this was related to almost nationalist tones, um, that terrorism was ruled off. Right. Well, I mean, the terrorism has been ruled off. Trish, the, the media is now saying investigators in Munich say they found no links between yesterday's mass shooting and terrorism. There's a, there seems to be a distinction there. Isn't a mass shooting terrorism? Well, I think that the distinction that's always used by sort of terrorism watchers and expert, experts and academics is whether or not there was a political goal. And so if we're looking at this in terms of the link to the Utoya massacre by um, Anders Bering Breivik, um, Okay, we're approaching the upload limit. Back with a new movie directly. Ciao.